Good evening, everybody. I'm still Larry Mason, former college professor for eight years and a computer system administrator for 30 years. I am continuously very obligated to Michael Shanklin and all those who help him bring you the Voluntary Virtues Network. Without his generosity, you would not be hearing my voice. I enjoy lecturing as much as any professor, but it will be more fun when we move to live shows so my listeners can ask questions and correct my errors. However, until then, we must make do with these pre-recorded lectures. This speech is the 33rd in the Invisible Hand series of talks, all of which involve money in one way or another. Invisible Hand is also the name of the novel which I hope this series of talks will inspire you to read if you have not already done so. Reading or listening to it will cost you only time since it is freely available on the internet in both text and mp3 formats at nopomstuff.info or if you're willing to spend a buck on Amazon you can download the novel to your Kindle. End of commercial message. Tonight's main theme is about the so-called War on Drugs. As background for this presentation, I will provide a brief summary of the conclusions of the first presentation in this Invisible Hand series, which examined the physical object nature of our money and some of the unfortunate consequences of that nature. I will be concise, so if you have already seen one or more of the earlier presentations, don't worry, this review won't take long. All money in history and prehistory has been considered to be or to represent physical objects such as a basket of grain, a cow, a coin, or a paper bill. Today most money is in computer accounts and though it zips around the world from account to account at almost the speed of light, it still is treated as if it were a physical object of some sort. Because we treat money as if it were a physical object, anything which is true of physical objects in general will also be true of money. This obvious point is ignored by economists and others who talk and write about money even though it is the most important truth about money. The importance of the physical object nature of money cannot be overstated. What follows are some of the consequences of that physical object nature. First, money is like other physical objects in that it can be taken from its owner against that owner's will by force, fraud, or stealth and it can also be lost or destroyed. This means that you need to suspect almost everyone of trying to get your money by fair means or foul. Second, Money must be amoral because all inanimate physical objects are amoral. Even animals are amoral in that they have neither an ethical sense nor morality, especially when they are used as commodity money. You can use your physical object money for anything, good or bad. Third, the money supply is independent of the supply of goods and services for sale because the supply of one physical object is independent of the supply of other objects. Fourth, Money falsely simulates a zero-sum game in monetary transactions because the money gained by one party must be lost by some other party or parties. Money makes us think that other people can gain money at our expense and that we can only gain money at their expense. It makes us treat others as if they were competitors, rivals, opponents, or even enemies. Fifth, money is almost impossible for a society or nation to control. In every nation that attempts to limit, regulate, or tax trade, a black market comes to exist and organized crime flourishes in all nations. Sixth, money transactions are two-party interactions. Two-party interaction is inherently unstable because if one party gets an advantage in power such as having more money, the stronger party can use that power to gain still more advantages. This is particularly true of money. The old saying, them as has gets, is true. Possession of money does make getting more money quite a lot easier. Naturally, the weaker party in such two-party interaction will eventually want to end the interaction. Thus, the relationship is unstable. Keeping that review in mind, let's consider the war on drugs. Popular culture has the war on drugs associated with the Reagan presidency and its Just Say No campaign. And it really doesn't matter who first popularized the phrase, though it came about during the Nixon administration. According to Wikipedia, the idea of labeling some drugs as dangerous and illegal first achieved the status of law for the U.S. in 1914, though local state laws were making some drugs illegal as far back as the Civil War. Many drugs were and are to be legally sold only if prescribed by a licensed doctor of medicine. If we compare the illegal drugs with the legal by prescription drugs and with the over-the-counter drugs which can be bought without prescription, it's pretty hard to tell which are which based on their chemistry or on their effects on the human body or mind. Certainly there are many potentially deadly drugs being sold in drugstores as we can tell from the commercials for those drugs on television. 
The list of harmful side effects of those legal drugs is frightening. Even aspirin can be a killer. A friend of mine was in the habit of taking a couple of aspirin right before bed to prevent a hangover the next morning. He seemed to think that would work. I have no idea if it helped or not. But those aspirin helped to give him a massive bleeding ulcer in his stomach and he almost bled to death. If he had passed out while driving rather than in the doctor's office as it happened, he would have died from blood loss. So almost any drug can be dangerous. That danger from drugs is not the reason why some drugs are illegal. Many drugs also have effects on the brain with resulting modifications of behavior. In some cases those effects can be dangerous to the user or others. Again, the warnings on the commercials for drugs sometimes mention things like not operating heavy machinery or not driving until one is sure the effects of the drug have worn off. Alcohol is a drug which can be advertised without those warnings. But nicotine does require warnings, and both are legal drugs which are dangerous and which affect behavior. So we cannot determine which drugs are illegal based upon their effects on behavior. Alcohol and nicotine products bring in billions in profits to the companies which produce and market these drugs. So that is one possible reason why these drugs are legal. But heroin and other illegal drugs also generate huge profits for organized crime, yet they remain illegal. In fact, one would suppose that organized crime bosses like having their products be illegal because that way they can maintain monopolies over distribution via illegal means whereas they would have far more competition for the market in addictive drugs if those drugs were legal to sell. The only reasonable conclusion is that which drugs are legal and which are illegal is more a matter of chance and tradition than of reason and chemistry. One would even suspect that our drug laws were more a product of electoral politics than of reasoned consideration of what would be best for the general public. Therefore, one must wonder whether the effort and expenses of the government's attempts to suppress the market in some drugs are really worth it. Let's examine the costs of attempting to suppress the use of recreational drugs. According to Wikipedia, in dollar terms, the Drug Policy Alliance estimates that the United States spends $51 billion each year. Those are the expenses of law enforcement such as police, the courts, and prisons. Wikipedia also reports a 2008 study published by a Harvard economist which indicated that the legalization of drugs would save the taxpayer roughly $40 billion per year. If the illegal drug trade were legalized, the taxes on that trade, if roughly equivalent to those on tobacco and alcohol, would generate over $40 billion per year. So the taxpayer suffers to the tune of over $80 billion per year just in tax money paid and tax money not collected. Of course, there are other costs besides the money spent by the government. When people are brought to court, they must have legal representation, a defense attorney. Though some attorneys contribute their time on a pro bono basis, most expect to be paid. Thus, the legal profession has considerable income each year from defending drug cases. The use of illegal drugs would be dangerous enough if conducted legally. We know the use of drugs is dangerous from the many deaths and injuries of various sorts from legal drug use by patients under the direct supervision of medical doctors in hospitals. When used illegally, the drugs become far more dangerous. The dosage, for example, is difficult to estimate with illegal drugs. What proportion of that white powder is actually the drug you have purchased from the pusher? Do you have the knowledge and the equipment to find out? I thought not. So, if you take your usual amount of the white powder, how much drug are you taking? How much active drug are you getting? For that matter, does that white powder contain anything besides the drug you want? Is it pure or does it contain contaminants? Back in the days of prohibition in the 1920s, the moonshiners included all sorts of things in the white lightning they were selling, sometimes on purpose and sometimes by accident. You have no good way to tell what's in that white powder. So ingestion of the product is dangerous and results in many deaths. The means of product delivery is also risky. If you use a hypodermic needle, is it clean? Do, you, do frequent injections harm your veins? One of the means by which AIDS has spread is via dirty needles shared by illegal drug users. These adverse effects of illegal drug usage exist only because the use of the drugs is illegal. If it were legal, like coffee and beer, the government could set standards and check up on the means of production and the cleanliness of the production facility. Public health procedures and inspectors could help the consumer to be assured that what they were getting was safe to use as directed.
Of course, tobacco is not safe to use as directed, but we'll ignore that for now. The costs, in addition to medical care and other expenses associated with injuries suffered by users, are not included in the cost of enforcement of the war on drugs. The loss in productivity, for example, of people under the influence is substantial. Traffic accidents due to mental incapacity increase your insurance rates as well. Next, let's consider the income gained by organized crime. The traffic in illegal drugs generates huge amounts of profits. According to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, quote, criminals, especially drug traffickers, may have laundered about 1.6 trillion or 2.7 percent of global GDP in 2009, unquote. Of course, these figures must be estimates since organized crime syndicates do not file annual reports with the United Nations. But even if they are off by a factor of 10, that's well over $100 billion per year in drug profits. That is a lot of money. That is also a lot of power. Organized crime sells products such as sex, drugs, and gambling. They feed goods and services to a mass market of hundreds of millions of people. Such an operation cannot be conducted without many millions of people knowing who sells those products. It is impossible to carry on those business activities without many ordinary citizens having direct knowledge of criminal activity. If those citizens all testified to the crimes of which they were aware, the market would collapse. If the police in all cities and large towns and almost all small towns did not ignore the crimes of which they are aware, if the police departments of the nation were not corrupted, organized crime could not exist. The criminal justice system must be subverted and compromised for organized crime to succeed. Therefore, another cost of the war on drugs is the corruption of the nation's police forces, its courts, and its prison administrations. Yes, you can buy drugs in prison. I don't know what you think such corruption is worth, but it's worth quite a lot to me. Corruption of police forces drives many good officers out of the service and attracts the kind of officers we don't want. Knowing that a substantial portion of the police accept bribes makes me very uneasy. Knowing that corrupt the corruption does not end with the cop on patrol makes things worse. Yes, those judges and attorneys in the DA's office must also be on the take. Next, let's consider all those folks being put in jail. Between 1980 and 2010, the percentage of the U.S. population that was incarcerated increased by a factor of four. That is, the percentage went from two-tenths of one percent to eight-tenths of one percent. I challenge you to find any other nation in the world that has such a high proportion of its adult population in jail. The war on drugs jails approximately a million people a year. Now, tell me whether having a conviction for a felony makes it more difficult to get an honest job. Given the job market these days, what would be your chances of getting work with a felony drug conviction on your resume? What kind of work could you get? Would it be a job that would use your skills to the fullest? Or would it be mindless minimum wage work at best? Could you borrow money? Could you get admitted to college? Would a union accept you? Would your prospective father-in-law accept you as his daughter's future husband? And think of your family. If you have children, how can you be a good parent from jail? Your marriage, if any, is likely to be ended by such a conviction or the economic aftermath, and who would want to marry a person with such poor prospects? So, putting those millions of adults and youth in jail for drug crimes almost eliminates their chance at a successful, productive life. I hear your response to that statement in my imagination. I hear you cry, it's their own fault, they should not have broken the law. Well, that's true in one way. Most of them did break the law and were guilty of the crime for which they were convicted. But justice is not blind, despite the statue you may have seen with her being blindfolded and holding scales. Justice is very aware of the racial, ethnic, and social class of the persons arrested for drug crimes. Quoting Wikipedia again, Statistics from 1998 show that there were wide racial disparities in arrests, prosecutions, sentencing, and deaths. African American drug users made up for 35% of drug arrests. 55% of convictions, and 74% of people sent to prison for drug possession crimes. Nationwide, African Americans were sent to state prisons for drug offenses 13 times more often than other races, even though they only supposedly comprised 13% of regular drug users." Unquote. 
Many studies have shown that the use of illegal drugs is about the same for all racial and ethnic groups. Yet the prisons are filled with young black men. That's not a coincidence. The law is designed to punish blacks for drug crimes far more than whites. It is clear that such was and is the intent of the drug laws. For example, again quoting Wikipedia, quote, In 1986, the U.S. Congress passed laws that created a 100 to 1 sentencing disparity for the possession or trafficking of, of crack when compared to penalties for trafficking of powder cocaine, which had been widely criticized as discriminatory against minorities, mostly blacks, who were more likely to use crack than powder cocaine." Unquote. If you are white and arrested for possession of drugs, you will probably get off without jail time. If you are black and arrested for possession of drugs, you will probably be sentenced to time in prison. As a white person, your attorney can probably get you off without a felony conviction for such a first offense. As a black person, you have almost no chance to avoid having a conviction on your record. Well, that's unfair and shameful, but so what? Where's the additional cost? We already included the cost of prisons in our costs provided before. I could point out that felons cannot vote, at least until they have served their full sentence and are off probation. Perhaps you are of the opinion that such a law is a good thing. I won't argue that point, or at least won't argue it here. But I will point out that a person who cannot vote is experiencing taxation without representation. At one time, that was a major motive for revolution. Of course, then it was our founding fathers who revolted against such unfair treatment and violation of the social contract which justifies, for some, the existence of government. By denying the rights of citizenship to those who are convicted of drug crimes in such a biased fashion by a corrupt criminal justice system, don't we encourage revolution rioting and other antisocial actions? Would you meekly submit to being treated like that? Would you not take some action against your oppressors? Wouldn't you find attractive the call to struggle against oppression, exploitation, and an unfair society? Let's say you were a radical communist agitator. Let's say you wanted to overthrow the U.S. government by force and violence, destroying along the way the Constitution and the noble ideals of American democracy. To whom would you go looking for recruits for your planned insurrection? Wouldn't you go to the outsiders, the excluded, the oppressed, the exploited, those who were treated most unfairly? Karl Marx and Frederick Engels were convinced that such people were the very ones who would be first to heed the call to rise up against capitalism. In other words, the use of the drug laws to suppress and exploit racial minorities for political purposes poses a very grave risk to the nation as a whole. I, for one, consider that to be a huge cost. Your opinion may differ. The source of many of the illegal drugs comes from outside the borders of the U.S. This means that international criminal organizations such as the Mafia are heavily involved in providing the products being sold to finance organized crime. Thus, whole governments are compromised and overturned by these powerful criminal enterprises. The present drug wars in Mexico, with their hundreds of dead and wounded, illustrate still further costs of our war on drugs. But those costs are being borne by others, and we don't care about them. Or do we? Aren't there children attempting to enter the U.S. fleeing organized crime in nations to the south of the U.S.? Those children seem to be creating at least political problems for our nation. But let's probe a little deeper. If the drugs are being imported to the U.S., doesn't the government attempt to stop such movement of illegal goods? Yes, they do. But that increases the cost of importing goods, since those imports are delayed by being examined and searched for drugs. In fact, at one time, the U.S. government, in 1969, attempted to really search carefully for contraband drugs and imports from Mexico. After some 20 days, they gave up, because there was a near shutdown of cross-border traffic. That cost millions to businessmen who complained bitterly. It also annoyed American tourists returning from vacations in Mexico. Next, there are the political costs of stopping the illegal drugs at their source. Take the poppy fields of Afghanistan, for example. Those fields provide considerable income to the local farmers and communities. In fact, they provide a substantial portion of Afghanistan's foreign trade. What happens if the U.S. military tries to shut down those farming operations? They create support and even sympathy for the Taliban. They create opposition for U.S. operations. In other words, 
Our drug laws in the U.S. are getting American soldiers killed in Afghanistan. There's also the use of drugs and drug money by the CIA and other clandestine government organizations. Again, to me, this is a substantial cost. You may feel otherwise. Finally, our use of herbicides to kill plants used to produce drugs creates a substantial expense in terms of ecological damage. In summary, our war on drugs has been a disaster. It has not reduced the consumption of drugs nor the damage from drug use. In fact, it has made that damage far worse from the consequences of the illegal addict's lifestyle. Other nations using other drug policies experience far less addiction and far less harm to addicts. The costs of conducting the war on drugs, both in tax money and other economic costs, is well over $100 billion per year. The costs in needless human suffering are far greater. The tragedies in millions of families can be directly traced to these bad laws. So why do we still have these laws? You must know the answer by now if you've paid any attention at all to the points made in my lectures. Remember those consequences of the physical object nature of our money? Look how they play out in the illegal drug trade. To begin with, everything we detailed in the lecture on illegal drug trade also applies to the illegal drug trade. All the same motives and means exist for illegal drugs. So the same processes which created the drug company giants also created crime organizations of similar size. But that is and was in the context of the drugs being illegal. Why were they made illegal in the first place? You may remember reading about prohibition, which banned alcohol consumption unless prescribed by a medical doctor. Prohibition was driven by religious fervor, literally. Women getting the right to vote and the power of fundamentalist religion combined to generate a politically powerful movement that opposed intoxicants. The use of opium by the Chinese laborers in the western U.S. also put drug use in a bad light. There were racists in the West as well as there were in the Old South. So even in 1914, there was political mileage to be gained by using racism and drugs. But there was more to the situation than that. There were economic forces as well. Those who sold other recreational drugs like alcohol, caffeine, and nicotine didn't want the competition. Doctors wanted to be able to control the supply of drugs so that patients would have to come to them to get the drugs they wanted. And yes, the drugs did do a lot of harm, both to the users who often became addicted and to the users' families who suffered economically, socially, and physically. It's easy to justify being opposed to crime. I can't recall ever hearing of a candidate for elective office running on a pro-crime platform. Politicians naturally gravitate to hot-button issues such as the evils of drugs and drug dealers. But some of the biggest beneficiaries of the war on drugs have been the police forces of the nation who confiscate money and property as part of that war. Just like some communities arrange speed traps to collect fines from unwary or out-of-state motorists, many police departments will create opportunities to increase the income of the county or city in enforcing the drug laws. Of course, physical object money, or POM for short, has motivated those who promoted the war on drugs and POM has likewise provided the means of conducting this war on our own people. Also, as is my usual approach, we can contrast the situation under a POM economy as described above with the situation if we were to change over to a non-POM economy. Let it be noted that organized crime depends on POM. It literally cannot function without POM. Organized crime sells to the general public, which requires POM. Organized crime uses POM to bribe officials. Organized crime uses POM to pay its henchmen. Organized crime uses POM to buy the raw materials to produce drugs. Picture your local drug dealer trying to sell some heroin with no POM available. The customer has no POM, so what would the drug dealer accept instead in trade? The transaction would be barter. The customer would have to be, have some physical object worth, say, $50. But wait, $50 is POM. Without POM, how would the customer and the dealer be able to decide what the value of the physical object was? Well, let's skip over that point and assume that the drug pusher and his customer were able to work out a deal. Now, the pusher has to repeat that process with a score of other customers. This is a slow process. In each case, the drug dealer has to haggle with the addict over what he will accept and how much of the drug the physical object being offered will buy. At the end of the day, 
the drug dealer will resemble a pawn shop. He'll have a hundred pounds of items, all used products. So he goes next to his supplier. The supplier will need a warehouse for all the miscellaneous junk accepted in trade. How is he going to use that junk to buy more raw materials for more drugs? How are any of the organizations going to pay the guys who work for them? Here, I have 25 pounds of electronic gadgets. How can they work out any kind of accounting? You see, it just won't work, especially when you consider that all those items are traceable. The ownership of those items is known, so they constitute a link between the drug dealer and the addicts. Something similar would be the case for all other organized crime activities. POM is an absolute requirement for organized crime to exist. So, in a non-POM economy, there would not be a major drug problem. There would be very little use of harmful recreational drugs, because any harm from use of those drugs would cost the suppliers of those drugs possible future income. Therefore, the war would be over without a shot being fired. There would be no need to make any drug illegal to minimize the harm from the use of drugs. There would be no corruption of police or other parts of the criminal justice system. There would be no point in keeping all those people in jail since the crimes of which they were convicted would no longer be possible or profitable. Remember that it's not easy to produce heroin or most of the other illegal drugs without considerable help from other people. With non-POM, none of that help would be available to anyone wanting to abuse drugs. Another advantage of non-POM would be that addicts would get appropriate treatment for their condition even if that treatment included more of the drug causing the addiction. If you have ever had a hangover from abuse of alcohol, you know that the pain and suffering can be reduced or eliminated by the hair of the dog. That is, if you drink more alcohol, the symptoms go away. And it doesn't take getting drunk again, just a little alcohol in the blood while the body readjusts. Also, this treatment for addiction would be without monetary cost to the addict. Therefore, no matter how poor, how down on his luck the addict may be in today's economy, with non-POM, that same unproductive person would get treatment even if she had no money to pay. Restoring an addict to good health is quite likely to also make that addict a productive member of the community. That's quite a lot of benefit to others in addition to the addict. Therefore, there would be considerable non-POM to be earned by those providing treatment and support for the addict. Remember that non-POM is earned based on the total net benefit derived from the consequences of each person's actions. Thus, addicts would be seen as great opportunities to earn lots of money. With POM today, the same thing is true of addicts. They are seen as great opportunities to gain money. The pushers sell them more drugs, the police seize their property, the criminal justice system shows how it is protecting the community by putting the addict in jail, the prison system gets a larger budget by being overcrowded, and finally, the addict winds up buying more drugs in prison all at a cost of over $20,000 a year to the taxpayer to keep him unproductive and in jail. With POM, everybody is busy exploiting everybody else. With non-POM, everybody is busy benefiting everyone else. So, with POM, we waste hundreds of billions of dollars and thousands of lives each year to fight the pointless war on drugs with its attendant suffering. While with non-POM, we would not only not have to spend that money, but would be even more productive from the rescue of the addicts produced by the POM economy. If you have ever had teenagers, you are quite aware that you cannot prevent their exposure to illegal drugs. Unless you lock them in a home prison of your own creation and monitor their every waking hour, which would be abusive to say the least, you cannot keep them away from the drugs. No matter how you may try to teach them of the dangers of drugs and how incredibly stupid it is to use drugs, they will probably have opportunities to try some, if only alcohol and tobacco. So, if you really want to do something to protect your children, you should thoroughly investigate non-POM. It's the only way you can safeguard them from the risks of addiction.